Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. So we need to make sure that we are off the field and working on the business, not working in the business, which is why it's important to have that team and tech. The team are the executors of those playbooks. Hey there, MU fam. Welcome back to the Millionaire University podcast. Hope you guys are enjoying our two episode per week drop. We went to that recently, and heck, by the time this episode comes out, maybe we're already up to three. Who knows? We're starting to pick up some steam and really get cruising here in 2024. Speaking of which, I hope your 2024 has been off to a great start. We're all the way into our second month already. It's hard to believe. Q1's going to be rounding out here in just about a month. Today's episode is bringing the heat. I brought a good friend of mine, Mike Abramowitz, with me from Better Than Rich. He is sharing his Time Rich Six method with us today. And Mike has a heck of a story, as you'll hear, heck of a businessman across multiple disciplines. But I wanted to have him chat with us about the higher level mindset when it comes to managing our time as entrepreneurs and business owners. I know this firsthand. I've been an entrepreneur for going on seven years here now. And managing my time is still one of the hardest things to do. And only in the last few years, year or so, have I really started focusing on actually giving a dedicated effort to focusing on my time. Because at the end of the day, we do this. We build our businesses. We become entrepreneurs because I imagine most of us want to find some sort of time freedom. Even the workaholics among us, time freedom needs to be a part of our lives. And we don't want to work for the man. We don't want to be an employee, right? We want to work for ourselves but we also want to have that time freedom. So that's why I wanted to bring Mike on with us today. And he absolutely brings the noise. It was such an awesome episode. I'm really excited to have you guys dive right in. So at the risk of me rambling and rambling, let's just have me shut up and jump right into this new podcast episode with Mike Abramowitz of Better Than Rich. Here we go. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Brian. I'm excited. I'm stoked because we're going to be talking about some really cool high-level mindset things today and something that you teach at Better Than Rich. Let me have you give some context and give us your story a little bit so that we can hear it uh, straight from you, Mike. Go for it. The short of it is I've been in direct sales for quite some time. So I started selling Cutco Kitchen Eyes when I was 18 years old. So I sold Cutco through college, paid my way through school. And when I graduated, I got my engineering degree from the University of South Florida and I advanced within the company. So I went in direct sales early in my 20s and then went into sales management out of college. I started investing into real estate. I had three houses by the time I graduated college and we could get into that if you want. But ultimately, from that place, I was all under the umbrella of trying to get ahead. I wanted to retire at 40. I wanted to work my ass off. I wanted to really work hard, prove my worth. So my self-worth was tied to my net worth. Let me make as much money as possible. Let me learn as many skills as possible. I was hungry. And then the market collapsed. (laughs) So 2008, I went belly up pretty much. I lost my properties. I lost $130,000 at a 400 credit score. I was near bankrupt. And then I established some pretty unhealthy like eating habits. My relationship kind of took a hit on that. Uh, All I knew how to do was just work. So I just worked my way out of it. I call it the valley of my 20s. So I don't know if any of the listeners could relate where you just like feel like you're kind of stuck in the crap and you're just like trying to work your way out like a hamster in a wheel. That was my 20s for me, dealing with like death of loved ones, dealing with the market collapse and finances, dealing with like being a grind in the business, just working 24-7. It was a tough season. 
And then uh, circa 2012, I went on uh, to a Tony Robbins event and I walked across fire. I'm a seven time fire walker now, but I walked across fire and I, at the, at that event, he said, my mess is my message. So what I did is I took all the valleys of my twenties and I turned to a message. I spent that next year. I spoke 300 hours in the Pinellas County school district over in the Tampa Bay area, crafting my message and volunteering and speaking. And, and that was the release of my first book, grab tomorrow, your best year ever. From there, built a nonprofit on the back end of that called PB&J for Tampa Bay. We provided over 100,000 sandwiches to less fortunate in the area. And now I had my direct sales office that I was grinding and working my tail off in. Then I built this other entity of speaking and book signing and writing these books. I had nine books. And then I was like, there's no way I could have a relationship. So I hired a business coach when I when I met my now wife. I, I was dating her and I really loved her. And I said, there's no way I could be a dad and a family person, and there's no way I can uh, really have the lifestyle I want. So I hired him as my business coach to help me get clarity of exactly what value I wanted to add to the marketplace while simultaneously building a business that I can do forever. So in my direct sales business, it's almost like taboo to like have offshore virtual assistants and automations and like different um, technologies that we put in place. This is before AI, but it was the closest thing that you can get using some of those things in, in direct sales. So I, I like McDonaldified my business for 2016, 2017, 18. And then 2020 hit, COVID hit. It was like all systems go boom. And it was awesome. I mean, we ended up providing over a thousand jobs that year. We did over two and a half million dollars in sales. We broke a lot of records. Uh, we won five national titles during the course of those two years. And uh, I mean, we were we absolutely crushed it. The big test happened though, Brian, when my son was born New Year's Eve. That was uh, December 31st of 2020. He was born at one pound, four ounces. So we were, uh, he was born at 26 weeks and we were in the hospital with him for eight and a half months. So due to all of the effort and energy of building out these systems in my business, I was able to be in the hospital with him and my wife for those eight and a half months, 254 days, and my business still was able to run without me. Produced over six figures in profits. And then when I got out of the hospital, September 10th, 2021, I called my business coach, Andrew Biggs, and I said, do you think we could teach people how to get time freedom from their business so their business can be a vehicle to help them buy back time? He said, let's find out. That was the birthplace of what we do for Better Than Rich and what we do offer with helping people become time rich. And that was the birthplace. Now we've helped hundreds of people, mainly business owners, just buy back their time, helping them understand what it means to be time rich. So that way they don't have to like go through the circumstances I went through, but if they wanted to have time to take their kid to school or time to go on a family vacation, my wife and I, uh, I just mapped out 2023. We just, or, or just reviewed 2023. We, t- I took nine full weeks off in 2023 without technology, no phone. And it was like, we took a three week road trip. We went on a Disney cruise. We went to Disney World. Like I went on two dad, tri- dad retreat trips, one to Utah and one to San Antonio. So it's like to be able to have nine weeks of freedom plus no evenings, no weekends and all Mondays off. I've built boundaries in my life that allows me to not only make good money. I saved over six figures last year, but also have the time freedom that goes behind it while helping other people do the same. So that's a very long, I said, I'll tell you the short version, but that's the long version of my story uh, on how I got to, you know, this conversation. It's such an awesome story, man. And congratulations on, on all those successes. And the fact that you're able to build that business to where you could be with your son and your wife in the hospital, taking care of, you know, a medical emergency that you didn't see coming, right? Like to have the freedom to be able to do that and not worry about is the next paycheck coming? How are we going to keep the house? How are we going to do all these things? Um, It's a testament to your ability to put those things together on the back end so they can stand strong when you aren't there to run them on the day to day. And the fact that you get that you took nine weeks last year. Very cool. So I love that that description of Better Than Rich. And I know you're looking to help other entrepreneurs win back. Um, and I know you say this uh, on your website, 13 to 37 plus hours a week for them, which is huge. And I can already say that you and I had a conversation a few weeks ago. I was having trouble with my calendar system. You at least bought me another hour or two per week already just from 
a quick phone conversation where you helped me understand a much easier and better way to run my calendar. So uh, you absolutely know what you're talking about. Of course, that's why we have you here today. So what we want to share with our listeners today is your your time-rich six methods. So I want to kind of hand off the mic to you and let's hear about those six methods. And I think they're going to have a huge impact for those of us who take them into account and put them into action and really excited to have those shared today. So uh, Mike, take it away, my friend. Time rich six. So the six, we could call them keys, you call them principles, whatever you like under the umbrella of becoming time rich. First one is boundaries. Second one is communication guidelines. The third one is systems. Number four is playbooks. Number five is team. And number six is tech. So we'll kind of go through each of them. I'll do a high level overview. And then if you want to kind of park on any of them specifically, we could park on any of them. So the first one, as far as boundaries, boundaries is how, how do you protect your time? So how do you protect your time for what's truly important? Think about yourself, think about your priorities, think about your loved ones, as entrepreneurs specifically, but really anyone, we can get into reaction mode very easily and respond to the urgent demands of different tasks that come our way. So if we don't have boundaries in place, then we could settle into reaction mode or we could just numb it all out and settle into distraction mode. And distraction, you, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there where you're just kind of scrolling aimlessly and for, you know, forgetting what, what was so important uh, you know, and why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, so we, we, we settle into distraction, we settle into reaction. So having these boundaries in place is really important. So we, in order to create boundaries, we need to know what are our priorities, what are we protecting? So what are we building our boundaries around? For me, I build boundaries around my mornings, my evenings, my weekends, and having one personal day in my schedule. And I built a ramp to get there. So the boundaries that I wanted to have is I wanted to have one day fully where I can have options to do whatever it is I wanted to do, whether it's strategy for business or just take a time for personal time, uh, get a massage, go to the gym, whatever I needed to do for that day. I need, Mike's, Mike needs a day. I also wanted to create a day where my wife has the exact same opportunity. Uh, so we we just had our second uh, newborn. So it's a little bit different now because my newborn, when we're recording, this is eight weeks old. So a uh, little different now. But what we have created for Lindsay is having her have a personal day where she has, a, uh, where I was with our son, James, as he got off the ventilator and got his trach out. And, you know, he's thriving now. So he's three for the last you know, several, maybe about a year now, I did daddy dates on Saturday. So that way I took James and I was able to hang out with him. And then my wife was able to have her personal day. So I created boundaries there. Sunday was family day where we would do something fun, go to the zoo, go to a theme park, go find live music, go to farmer's markets, whatever we wanted to do, free day on Sunday. Mornings are for Mike. Mornings are where I would protect my time. If I want to go to the gym, go to the gym. If I want to read, I want to read. I want to journal, I want to journal. I want to reflect, go for a walk, whatever. First calls at nine. So no one can hop on my calendar before nine. So nine to four, sometimes nine to five, depending on the season, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then nine to three on Friday. Evenings, I was able to protect after the four o'clock from like four until five. Let me decompress my day clear out whatever I need to clear out on uh, just projects and tasks. And then I would go into the family, put the phone up. I don't need the phone anymore. No technology for the evening. So that way I could be present. That was what I created for myself. And from there, there's versions of it, depending on what season, depending on vacations and travel. But I knew I wanted to create that schedule. So a lot of what I was doing, my business being a vehicle, I wanted to set up my vehicle called my business that allows me to drive in a direction that allows this these boundaries to exist. So that's why it's important for a listener to figure out what are you protecting your time for? What is most important to you? If someone looks at my schedule, they'll say, what's most important to you? Well, I have families, obviously, most important, and myself being able to fill my cup is most important, and having intentional conversations with people. If you look at my daily activities from nine to four, it's very intentional with what I'm doing and who I'm speaking with. It's a lot of me interacting with live, real-time humans and creating partnerships and doing high-level work, sales conversations, prospecting, partnerships, guesting on podcasts, these types of things that add a lot of value to me, but also add a lot of value to the marketplace. So that's number one boundaries. And for me personally too, that's one of the hardest things to A, develop and B, stick to. 
just in the last few months here, uh, really since I was chatting with you more closely, Mike, was really developing my boundaries, putting them down on paper, and then actually sticking to them. So for example, for the last two weeks, I've been journaling uh, in the morning and in the evening. And it's just one of those things where I'm like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to stick to it, and I can't quit it. And now I'm starting to get in that habit. I'm still within that 30-day window of once you do something for 30 days, it's much easier to keep it as a habit as opposed to dropping it. And then also with boundaries, like my, my goal is to, and sometimes it's, it's much harder, easier said than done to end my day when I say I will, but I'm trying to get better at once uh, 4.30 rolls around, unless I'm picking up my kids at daycare at 4.20, those are three days a week, but it's phone goes up on top of the fridge where I can't see it. So that way, like you said, being present with the family and dedicating that time to it, because it is so easy to have work creep or friends too. Like, you know, you have friends texting or if you're in group chats or family chats or something, it's so easy to be distracted and to, you know, it bothers me that my kids have seen me on my phone, right? Like way more than I want them to. So I think boundaries is absolutely huge. Um, and I, I'm sure that's why it's number one on your list. It is number one for that reason, because you got to figure out what the priorities are before you can start playing the game. You got to figure out what is out of bounds before you could start playing the game. What are the rules of the game? You know, you could call life a game. You could call business a game. That's really what it is. It makes it a lot more playful when it is when it's a game. So what are the rules of the game? What is out of bounds? Let's start there. It pairs really well with number two, which is the communication guidelines, which is how do I want people to communicate with me? What is the way people get my attention? So you want to think about what is the strategy for managing these constant streams of demand that come to you, whether it's calls or messages or emails. So how do you establish rules of engagement that safeguard your, your personal time, your family time, but also your professional time? Uh, I'll give you an example. I just recently had a prospect. She's a really good prospect. And uh, she just signed up for one of our, our mini course that we we have online, like real low ticket offer. And it's a really high value course. She's getting, she gets content, uh, five hours of content on how to implement a CRM into her business, how to properly delegate, build a flow chart for her business, how to build an org chart for her business, how to use AI and ChatGPT for her business. I mean, it's really, really fantastic content. And one of the also things that we give is a free complimentary coaching call. She also gets a 125 page workbook. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really large value add for 29 bucks. Well, she has now rescheduled. She's booked that coaching call and rescheduled. This is her fifth time. I didn't even notice because I don't manage my calendar, but every, you know, I, I started seeing the trends and I reached out to my virtual assistant and I said, Hey, this isn't okay. Do we have like guidelines for this, for people to hop on my calendar? Uh, could they just reschedule all the time? And he's like, good question. We really don't. This is a perfect example of what happens if there's not some sort of guidelines in place and because of this, now I'm going to put a guideline in place for this specific link where you could only reschedule one time. The, on the third time, the link will, you'll remove access for the link. We'll just cancel the event if it pops up on our calendar. You only get two reschedules. That's an example of a communication guideline. So that way people don't constantly hop on the schedule and like take up somebody else's time and then reschedule. And then I'm left with a gap in my schedule. I don't like gaps in my schedule, no white space, unless it's intentional white space. So that's an example. So you might think about for you, what are the examples of people trying to get your attention? Or if they're interrupting your flow by doing what, it, what this woman has, has done with me. So in the past for me, I was in, especially in direct sales, I had a thousand clients that bought Cutco from me. I also recruited a ton of students. I mean, 5,000 people is how many I've recruited during my career in direct sales. So I was having the current sales team have my personal cell phone number. I had the prospects, the referrals to work with us. Those that wanted to work with us had my personal cell phone number. And then all my clients had my personal cell phone number. So how many calls do you think I would get on a daily basis? A little too many. Tons of calls. So because there wasn't any guidelines, there was no parameters, anybody can get my attention just because they had my phone number. You could just hear that and say, huh, well, we should probably create some sort of system, some sort of guidelines, some sort of parameters on how people could get Mike's attention. And that's exactly what I did. So 
using simple tools like Calendly. So right now I have probably 25 different events on Calendly. If it's a friend, they get a catch-up link. If it's someone who wants to book a call for uh, learning about our our virtual assistant services, we have a free 90-day delegation plan that we'll put in place. By the way, that's that's available for anybody that's listening too. I will do a free 90-day delegation plan with anybody who is interested in getting some things offloaded or picking apart some of the stuff that we're talking about. It's a 40-minute session, 30, 40 minutes with me. I'm doing all of these right now. And uh, you'll also get a 25-page time audit workbook that's paired with that. It is an immense value add. You could go to betterthanrich.com slash 90 day call, 90 day call. And that's pretty much what what you and I did on that call, Brian. We just map out how do we create some time freedom. And a lot of times it's going to be to from delegating certain tasks off your plate. But so uh, that, that's just a, a free offer, a gift to anybody who wants to take me up on it. I'd love to have that conversation, but that's a specific link. If somebody wants to be a guest on my podcast, that's a link. If someone wants to book me on their show, I have a link for them to see my schedule. So there's just all these different links for different events. If someone calls me and I'm not available, like I don't know who it is or I, they're not on my schedule, my policy is I respond with a text message that says, hey, what can I help you with? Uh, you know, is there something you need? I don't answer the phone. I just send them a text message. And they're like, oh, I needed to ask you about blank blank. It's like, great. Can you send me an email to this email? And then my VA will handle the email. When we get to team, that will probably make more sense. But these are just some examples as far as communication guidelines. I don't know if there's any, again, specific questions or... It's kind of like digital triage, right? You've got all these different inputs coming in from various locations and just like if, you know, it, it, at a hospital, for lack of a better example, you know, you've got a triage who's coming in, what do they need? What priority is it? And your example of you don't answer phone calls from numbers you don't recognize. You send them a text saying, basically, who are you and what do you need? And then from there, you have them email where you, you dump them into your system so that they can get the proper help that they need. Or you can filter it out and be like, either this isn't for us or this is or whatever, and your team can help decipher it from there. So that's also a huge part of the game as well, those communication guidelines. So I think that's fantastic. And one thing that I use a lot is voice memo too, because if I do know who it is, like I do know that they're trying to get my attention, but I don't have the capacity or the energy or the time to dedicate real time to them right now. Just hit them with a voice memo. I learned recently, probably within the last year, that I could voice memo from my iPhone to an Android by just going into the voice memo app on my phone, recording an Emma, a voice memo, and then changing the name to their name. So I would say voice memo for you know, Brian as an example, and then I'll just forward that voice memo to them so I could still have, but it's on my time. So the, the idea here is I don't want to ever give permission to someone that they can get my attention live, real time. Anytime somebody wants my attention, it is on my time, not real time. And that might sound like crazy, but that is what I wanted. When I built those boundaries, that's what I wanted. And it took a time. It wasn't like snap my fingers and it happened. It was a ramp over the course of, uh, I don't know, probably 18 months to train people in my life to enforce these boundaries and to make sure that these guidelines were put in place. Love it. I think that's fantastic. Hit us with number three. What do you got? So number three is systems. Okay. Now systems is the probably the meatiest of the topic. So I'm not going to go into so much detail here because I don't know if every listener runs a business or not, but if someone does run a business, this is really where it makes sense. And a system is it really the question there is, How do you ensure that your business operates on a structured system that delivers predictable outcomes instead of leaving things to improv? Because too many business owners are like, uh, let's just find out. Let's just see what happens. Or, you know, they enter into reaction mode because there's not predictability in place. So the way we define a system in Better Than Rich is a series of processes, policies, and technologies that aid in the goal of the business. So what is a process? A process is a series of if-then statements. If this happens, then I want this to happen. So it's very predictable. It's premeditated. You could think of it as like a flow chart. That is the base level of building a business system. So if a prospect has a question, then I want them to go to 
our frequently asked questions library before they call me. If they went to our frequently asked questions library and it still didn't answer their question, then they can use this link to book a call to get on our calendar, right? Like, so it's like a flow chart of series of if thens as an example. And you do that for every department in the business for attracting like lead gen, for conversion like sales, for onboarding, and then for retention. And that's for talent and also for clients. So you do that for every part of the journey. So that's processes. And then the policy is kind of like number four, which is the playbooks, but it's what is the written documentation that enforces those processes? What is the written documentation? That's really the policy, also known as the playbook. How are people equipped with a like a comprehensive resource that navigates them to understand those if-thens? That's like the policies. And then the technology really is technology or team, which is what are the tools or who's that we're going to be using to reinforce these policies, these playbooks, and also making sure that those if-thens are, are getting implemented. Again, this is a very short, quick overview of those four. I'm going to almost like prefer to kick it to you to draw out of me what you feel is most relevant to your audience, but the systems is like the foundation. And then the playbooks would be the resources to support those systems. And then the team are who are the who's that are going to like execute the day-to-day. And then the tech is what is the technology that the who's are going to be using to make sure that it's a great user experience for everyone that's involved. And that's where like AI or Zapier or project management softwares like a Trello or a ClickUp and learning management softwares like a Thinkific or a Kajabi. Calendly, I already mentioned, like a, or Acuity, like a scheduling software. Like all those technologies kind of support those who's, the team, the virtual assistants, whoever it might be. So again, lots of different directions we can go. I'll kick it to you to kind of help me unpack whatever you feel is most relevant to your listener. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, systems are, in my experience, that's one of the harder things to build when you are just starting out. I know a lot of our listeners are just starting out or maybe you're about to, and uh, many of you already have, maybe you're one or two years or more into your business, but it might correct me if I'm wrong, but it can take a while to figure out what your best systems are, because throughout the life of a young business, there is a lot of adapting and pivoting that goes on. So is it accurate to say that these systems, you can create one on on day one, but you have to be able to pivot and change your systems a little bit when needed on day 400? I would say there's a yes end. So we we have something called the five D's of systemization that we teach in Better Than Rich. So the five D's of systemization, the first D is design. So Yes. Does it take a little bit of time to design something? Sure. However, every single business owner, every single person that is doing a task, they already has some sort of design to it. Like you might not have it documented, which is the second D, right? So you design, but then you need to document what this design is, right? So the documentation of the design, that's the part that people don't document their design. But then the third D is dissemination, which is training. How do you train someone on this design? And that might even be you. That might be your virtual assistant. See, Dan Martell in his book, Buy Back Your Time, calls it the camcorder method. Too many times a new business might say, I'm just doing the task to get the task done. What Dan Martell and what I teach is do the task with the anticipation that I only do it once. And the next time it's documented so somebody else can do it for me as me, just not by me. So I do the task with the hallucination that it's going to be delegated in the future. That's why for me, I record 95% of anything that I do. I click record on Loom, which is one of those technologies. So it's capturing what I'm doing. So then if I need to turn it into an SOP or a playbook or need somebody else to do it, they can do it the second time or the third time. The disillusionment that I've had in the past is I only need to do this one time. So I'm just going to do it real quick to get it done until the next time happens. I'm like, shit, I got to do this thing again. So enough of those conversations with myself have led to that. So dissemination is the training. 
And then uh, number uh, three is defend. Defend is the um, policing of it. Like, let's see if it actually works. Let's make sure that it's effective. It's getting implemented. Let's make sure there's accountability in place that those that I trained are actually qualified to put this into place. It's getting done the right way. So the defend is almost like an accountability part of it. The fifth D, that's where we want to reevaluate to see if we need to adjust the system. Is this system outdated? That's like the process that we walk through when doing any type of task. So you are already probably doing a version of this as someone new to business. It's just not as formulaic. It's vitally important to be able to design these. But I think the biggest thing, and it took me, it might sound really simple and I might just be an idiot, but the actual documentation of the thing. When I when I started bringing on uh, folks to work with me um, at a VA and currently with an ops manager, uh, a big thing about what we're doing is documenting everything we do. So like Mike said, using Loom. But the documentation is huge because if you're bringing on teammates, if your goal is to take your business and grow it, have multiple people, and maybe the, the sky's the limit for you, then documenting these things are going to be vitally important because like Mike said, if you keep having to repeat this dang thing or with every new hire, new VA you bring on, new you know manager you bring on, if you have to show them exactly how to do it again, now you're abusing your time because that's time that you're not spent doing the higher level tasks of growing your business or whatever the tasks are that day. You're now violating your own time. So I think of those documentation is uh, the big one to really put some emphasis on. So playbooks, we mentioned that playbooks are the resources. So Give us a little bit of an in-depth look at playbooks. What does this mean in terms of the resources for your business? So you might call playbooks uh, SOPs or standard operating procedures. I like Dan Martell's language where he calls them playbooks. It just uh, it feels real nice with our, our community and my just language that I use. So it's exactly that. It's a standard operating procedure. It is a documented, uh, some sort of resource that makes it simple for someone else to do the task. So you think about like a checklist as an example. If I'm a pilot, I review my checklist before I take off my pl- on the plane. That would be a playbook. If you're in sports, that one's pretty easy. There are different plays for different situations. Every situation has its different play. If it's fourth and long and you're down by a touchdown, you got the, the Hail Mary play. There's a design for that play. If you're on the goal line, there is a play. Same thing in business. Every part of the business deserves its own play, such as how is my inbox managed on my email? How is my inbox managed on my social media? How do I get content published onto my social media? How do I handle inquiries from prospects? These are all different plays. How do I respond to someone who's interested in our services? How do I respond to pre-existing clients who have questions about their next payment? There's so many plays that you can come up with. And that's why knowing the departments of the business, attract, convert, onboard, retain. And inside of those, again, there's those four things for talent and also for client. Talent would be attracting new talent to your business that you want to interview and hire and then Converting them would be running the interview and making sure that they're hired for the position and then onboarding them to make sure they're integrated into the culture of your business, training them the right way, and then retaining the talent to make sure that you raise them in a healthy environment. That would be like, what is your meeting cadence for those individuals? And then the same thing on a client journey, lead gen, attracting them to your business, converting them as sales, onboarding those new clients, making sure that they're getting access to whatever resources and that you promised them in the sales process. And then client retention, lifetime value of the client to continue to serve them at the highest level so you could retain those clients for long term and have different offers for them, ascension offers and whatnot. So the same concept for both parties, but every inside each of those, there's a lot of different plays. Those are the playbooks. Those are the resources that you want to have documented as much as possible from what are the scripts that you have for your sales call? What are the ads that you're placing for new hires? What is the process for those new hires? Like what is the application process? How do they submit a resume? All of those design there. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of playbooks. And frankly, that's why as a business owner, 
if you're too busy doing the play, it's really tough to take a step back to design the play. The coach is not going into the game to run the play. The coach is calling the play. So we need to make sure that we are off the field and working on the business, not working in the business, which is why it's important to have that team and tech, which the team are the executors of those playbooks. That's spot on. I love that. And as a sports guy, uh, anybody who sees my background on the recording here, you can tell I'm a sports guy. I love using the term playbooks and you kind of just piece it together for me where taking it one step further, it's not just a playbook. It's, it, it is a playbook, but it's literally the plays. Like when you said, what are our sales scripts? What do our ads look like? You know, how do I respond to this scenario? How do I handle that scenario? Write out the play and then execute it you can execute it. And then the people you hire, the people that work with you can execute it. I think that's an absolutely perfect way to refer to it. And then diving right into the team side. So I want to get to some more questions on the tech, but team is just as important. So finding the right who's, and I know I see the book on uh, behind your shoulder there, Who Not How, one of my all-time favorite books. I recommend anybody go read that book. That'll kind of enlighten you to the concept of Who Not How, because As business owners, um, that's one of the most important things that we can do. So on attracting team members, honestly, in my own business, this is one of the things I'm really diving into now is really honing in on my people, on my who's. Best tip you have when it comes to how can I handle finding the right who? And that might be a really loaded question, but (laughs) I want to see what you have for that. It is a loaded question because it depends on what you're finding the who for. So we need to make sure we know what the outcome is that we want this who that we're injecting into the business. So if we're finding a who for sales is going to be different than finding a who for admin, right? So that's why I like what Dan Martell teaches in his book, Buy Back Your Time. Uh, The replacement ladder is what he calls it. So you want to start with administrative. What is all the admin that you could get offloaded to your first who. Then he goes into either marketing or fulfillment. Those are really the other than the next two I that I have found I've interchanged back and forth between those two. And then it's sales and then it's leadership. So I would recommend that anybody's listening to this, you start with admin. What is all the administrative that needs to get offloaded? And that's the first who, which is why virtual assistants and administrative assistants are going to be the best place to start. And when I say a virtual assistant, 98% of any administrative that needs to get done for most businesses can get done in the virtual world, whether that's creating copy or creating content or managing your inbox or social media posting, video editing, podcast production, even fielding phone calls, incoming phone calls, making outbound phone calls. Like you could even put that under administrative dep- on some depending, depending if it's not a, uh, you know, sales calls, if it's just inquiry calls or, you know, collecting payments or something like that. Sending outbound messaging, sending this could almost fall under marketing, but it's the administrative of marketing, sending out emails creating CRM updates like automations inside the CRM and updating the newsletter as an example. Like everything that's administrative is the first to get offloaded. So how do you find a who to inject into your business to handle all the administrative? There's tons of different ways. You could go to fiverr.com. You could go to upwork.com. You go to freeup.com. There's different services out there. You could go to indeed.com and hire someone for administrative. There are challenges for each of them. Like if you go to free up or if you go to like Upwork or free up or, or, or Fiverr or one of these places, they're low cost. You can get five to $10 an hour and it could go pretty far for you for a lot of the admin. The challenge is the quality of work, the reliability, they're only contractors, their availability. You got to almost like give them the test project. So it takes the business owner a decent amount of time to save money. But then you go on the complete opposite end of the spectrum where you go to pay a company like a a large sum of money. Like when I hired my first virtual assistant, I paid a company $2,500 to find me a quality, reliable who. And if that one person wasn't good, they would find a replacement for me. So it was worth it. So I didn't have to spend the time, but they would find the quality for me. Then the Indeed.com approach I've done, which is for specialists that you know require a little bit more of the internal, like I want to bring them onto my team. But that took, again, a lot of time. And if they quit, I had to do the process all over again. So I actually created a service 
to offset all of those, which is our agency that we do with our AI powered virtual assistants. And if somebody is interested, obviously, you know, they could learn more and I'd be happy to have a conversation with them. But we have a one stop shop to essentially handle all of those administrative operations for a busy business owner. And that way they just use our services and we'll provide them a team that can handle all this stuff for them. But ultimately, there are different ways to find these who's, but I would start with administrative because that's going to be the low value tasks that consume a lot of attention and distraction energy for a business owner. That's where I would start. And then once someone has that person in place to answer the question on the table, which is how do you find the right who? Well, then you would go into marketing, then you would go into fulfillment. And again, you go through what is the model that I just said. You could go low cost, lots of time, or you could go high cost, minimal time. It just depends on the strategy and and uh, also the the season that you're in in business. I love it. I think that's perfect. Probably starting to get in the boat close to harbor here. So I want to talk about the tech side of this. We could probably have our own episode about this, but how do you not get buried or just intimidated by all the choices for tech out there? I started using a CRM, uh, a different CRM a few months ago, and I, I enjoy it. I like it. It's a good one. I use monday.com. But then you get out on LinkedIn and you see everyone talking about Notion or you know HubSpot or whatever the other options are out there. How do you not get buried under all the millions of options we have for tech for different portions of your business? Again, different chapters, different seasons. I mean, I've done the same thing. I started with MailChimp, then navigated Active Campaign, and now we're on Go High Level. So I, I'm with you. There is like a graduation process. And as the business evolves, sometimes we need the technology to evolve with the business, which is fine. How do you pick a lane and stay in the lane? Well, think about it this way. If you are dating someone, you say, okay, I'm just dating you. You know, I could date other people while I'm dating you. That's okay. I could test out these other apps. But once I commit to you and you are now my spouse, I'm married to you, I'm no longer looking at all the other options that are in the marketplace because I've already made my commitment and I made my decision. Everything else is a distraction from the main thing. Because if your person that you're with, that you committed to, notices that you are looking at all these other places, what is that going to make them feel like? They're going to feel insignificant. They're not going to feel like you're, lo- you're, you're taking care of them. Keeping that in mind with a tech solution is kind of a similar way I would approach it. Once you commit, just commit and make it work. And if you need to get a divorce <laughs> from the technology that you made a commitment to, just make sure you have valid reason. It's not just because that's a nice, beautiful, shiny object and they're really attractive. There's an actual valid reason of why this marriage isn't working and why I need to make sure I'm moving to this other tech solution. So that would be my analogy I'm coming up with on the fly, which I really like. And uh, I think that could be a really good answer there. One thing I will say, though, is there is a lot of uh, a lot of noise in the marketplace with tech solution, especially centered around AI. So what I would recommend somebody doing is finding a who that can be the sourcing of being on the cutting edge. If you're the business owner, at least for me, I could, can't speak for you. For me, it's a distraction to try to be in the know of all the new changes that are happening in technology. I don't need to know all the new fancy bells and whistles. I have someone on my team that that's their job. Their job is to be on the cutting edge of all the AI and technology advances and stuff. That's not my job. That is a distraction for me from focusing on the main thing. So I think it's important for you to know what is your role in the company and who is a who that you want to put in charge of learning about those tech solutions would be my suggestion. Yeah. And I can tell you from my experience, bringing on my ops manager has been great for me because the biggest thing to date that he's helped me do, besides uh, getting a bunch of our fulfillment stuff out the door, is the tech stack, getting me set up on Monday. Like Those things overwhelm me. I've tried HubSpot in the past. I tried, I think I was on high level for a while. And it's just because my mind isn't technical. I don't survive in those tech spaces So that's where after enough time had passed, I was like, I need to bring someone on board who this is their zone of genius. They can handle this for me and say, hey, Brian, I set this up this way based on the input you gave me. I think this is the best system for us at Ricochet to get this taken care of. And that was to date, still the best thing I've done in the last three months is hiring that person to help me get that in place because now I can actually have my sales pipeline. It's in existence. I can see it. It's color coded. I love it. And I can have all our task management. It's all placed there. I can see 
where we stand on each individual task. So I can vouch for the fact that it really helped me just get out of my own bottle when I brought someone on that can show me the right tech that we need based on um, what I explained to them that I wanted. Team and tech can kind of swap interchangeably. Like, let me find the tech solution first, and then I'll build my team around the tech. That didn't work for me because I'm with you. I'm not a big tech guy. So I build my team. And then what is the tech that that team needs? That's just because I naturally am better at delegation to a who than delegation to a tech. So that's just the way I teach it because that's the way I've learned it. And that's the way I'm naturally uh, inclined to move in that direction. But depending on where you're at, you could build your business on the tech solution and then find the who's that are qualified and trained on that tech solution. I just have done it the opposite direction. Let me find the who's and then I'll figure out what are the tech solutions that those who's need. The playbooks that you have in your business, where do you store them? What part of your tech stack are those all stored on? How do you organize that? So we built everything on Google Drive for the last several years. I built my $19 million uh, direct sales business on Google Drive. Now, as we're scaling up, we grew from a uh, you know, 100K company to a 600K company in the last two years. Now, as we're growing to a seven-figure company for this year, we just uh, are building everything on ClickUp. So we uh, have an entire operations team taking everything that we have on our Google Drive and have been migrating it over to ClickUp. And it is thousands of dollar type of tech solution. But to be able to scale up, that's what we're doing. But I I can tell you, we built a multi six figure company, several multi six figure companies on the back end of a free Google Drive. So and selfishly, that was a question for myself because I wanted validation that me using Google Drive as heavily as, heavily as I do is the right move. <laughs> it's free and free is for me if you could build a profitable business from it. But when you went ready to scale, you might need something a little bit more sophisticated. Absolutely. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you being with us. This information, I think, is just so much gold that we've uncovered here and uh, sharing your your time rich six with us. Lots of information that our listeners can go and take, whether you've already started a business or a few years into it, or if you haven't yet, these are all foundational things that I believe you need to have in mind as you're starting out, because you can save yourself a lot of headaches from starting a business and not being aware of these things and finding six months, a year, two years down the road, that it would have been way easier to avoid some of these pitfalls. So Mike, thanks a ton for joining us. Uh, how can our viewers find you? I appreciate that. I Like I mentioned in the beginning of the episode or in the middle, I would love if any of this resonates and you want to hop on with me, I'm doing all of these right now. I will do a free 90-day delegation plan with you and you'll also get a 25-page time audit workbook that will help you figure out what is your target dollar per hour and then what are all the low-value tasks underneath that target dollar per hour. We'll figure out how to get all of that delegated. And then if it makes sense at the end where you say, great, now that I want all this stuff delegated, if it makes sense where our team can handle those things for you, I could tell you a little bit more about our AI powered virtual assistant services and seeing if it's a good fit where our team of to-do list tacklers can handle all those tasks for you. We have a monthly subscription and uh, it, it makes it really easy for someone to just click one button and then boom, they could have a team put in place for them that's already specialist and qualified to be able to knock out 95% of all your administrative. So again, betterthanrich.com slash 90 day plan. That's nine zero day plan. So betterthanrich.com slash 90 day plan. Awesome. Mike, appreciate your time. Appreciate your knowledge with us. It's been fantastic. I had a great time. We'll catch you on the next one. Sounds great. Thanks for having me. And there we have it, folks, the Time Rich Six Method from Mike Abramowitz. I wish that I had this full knowledge, this method, this little system in place when I first started my business. Even though starting out, you might not need to do a deep dive on these. You don't have a ton of SOPs yet. You don't have a ton of processes or systems yet. It's still the best time to start developing them. You know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today, right now. Do these things, even if you're doing one bullet point from each of these, stick with them and put them in place. I think you'll be thanking yourself as your business grows with you. Thank you again to Mike for joining us. Fantastic mindset shift that can really play a massive role in your life and in your business. When we became entrepreneurs, we wanted to have this business so that we could find this time freedom, that we could live our own lives on our terms the way we want to. But it is very easy 
to let time slip away and to get taken advantage of sometimes by yourself. It's your own fault. It's my fault when my time gets away from me, right? So having this time-rich six method, I think is just a fantastic way for us to be able to win back some of our time and be even happier and more successful entrepreneurs. Whether you're starting your business, whether you haven't started it yet, or if you're a year or two in the business, these time-rich six points can be placed in your business at any point. And I'm even going to go do a double check on my checklist of things that I'm doing that I can improve from what I learned from Mike today. So hope you enjoyed that episode. If you haven't started your business yet, do yourself a favor, go to millionaireuniversity.com and check out our free business course. We have the resources that you need to get your idea from a concept and idea into you taking action and starting your business. Give it a look. We want to help you as much as we possibly can. And don't forget to check out Mike at betterthanrich.com. Thanks again for him for uh, sharing his knowledge with us today. That's all we have for you on the Millionaire University podcast. We'll catch you on the next one. Mm -hmm.